This is my first ever dinner talk. Um, so you are part of the bleeding edge, actually. Hopefully, you'll enjoy it. I am sure that over the periods of the training program, you are going to have lots of exciting talks. You're going to get lots of new information. Your brains are going to be stuffed full. And in fact, you may feel like they're exploding at times. Um, don't panic. This talk is not like that. Uh, I am just going to walk you through some anecdotes, some experiences that I've had as I stood up some of the large systems and, uh, and give you a feel for what it's like to be at the bleeding edge. Now, I'm going to start off rather oddly. I'm going to take you back, way back to when I was a young person and I uh, got my first job. It was at the Phoenix Zoo, which is kind of odd, and there was no computers involved at all. But, um, and I didn't have an exciting job. I uh, took tickets at the entrance. I picked up trash. I put food in the feeders. I did things like that. But it was an exciting place to work. And one of the things that made it exciting was back in the 70s, which is when I was working there, um, they had typically at zoos these small cages for the animals. I don't know if you ever went to any of those. And they were really kind of sad. Uh, the Phoenix Zoo is one of the sort of state-of-the-art zoos that they were starting to build these lovely habitat enclosures. And they were large, and they, this is some of their pictures from um, today, but they were these large habitats, and the animals had lots of, of their native grasses and plants, and they were huge. And in fact, it was kind of challenging for people who were visiting at that time because they hadn't worked out how they could make it so you could actually see the animals <laughs> because they could hide from you in these large things. And I traveled. There's a train that you can ride around this very large zoo. And it was lovely. It was a fun place to work. And I really enjoyed it. But I learned one lesson from this job. And that was that I was really not cut out to work year round outside in Phoenix, Arizona. So my next job that I got was actually at a Ford dealership. So another change, this time with computers. And that was the computer that I was on. It's a Burroughs computer. And you could look at it and say, well, that's not really in a computer. But it had a mainframe behind it. And I, would, I actually kind of looked like this woman here. Um, not quite, that's not me, but I was hunched over this data entry thing. And I would enter invoices and accounts payable and all of those financial records into this computer. And I would sit there for eight hours a day, five days a week. And um, I learned a few things from this job as well. I learned, one, that when you are working on a computer on a financial system, they really care about the pennies. They really care that everything balances. And so you have to worry about rounding errors and all of these other things having to do with floating point. I also learned um, that this was not the kind of job I really wanted to be at. I didn't want to be hunched over a computer eight hours a day, five days a week, doing data entry. And of course, today, I'm hunched over the computer about seven days a week, maybe 10 hours a day. And I'm not doing data entry. I'm actually doing something maybe slightly more interesting. Um, but I also learned one other thing. Now, you may or may not be familiar with green bar paper. Green bar paper was a special paper for these computers. That's what's sitting on the floor, and it's being fed up through the thing. And as you type, it makes a paper record of what you're entering by printing it, sort of like a you know, typewriter. Very much feels like and looks like a typewriter. But that data you're entering is also going into the mainframe. Um, and then we would go through a whole, you get a box of this paper, like you can see on the floor. And you would go through a whole box, and you would then take all that paper, pack it back in the box, and they would cart it off to the storage location. And one of the things that I learned from here is that you have to be very careful about where you store your printed documents. Because the dealership was storing the boxes above the storage for their oil. And it was out by the service department. So you guessed it. Auditors came in. They said, we want to see your printed records. They went out, and they brought the boxes in. <laughs> And they were covered and soaked in oil and the dirt and the dust. And they were just grody. And when we opened them up, that green bar paper was basically, there was nothing left on it. It was all gone. Um, so that was one of the things that I learned from that job, 
was that I, I really needed to know how to store my paper records so that they would still be around in a year. Now, from there, I went to uh, school. And I'll take a little sidebar there. I went to um, a university. And I didn't start out as a computer science major, but that's what I got my degree in, computer science and math. And um, I, it was a university in Texas, Sam Houston State University. And it was a young computer science department, very young. It had split off from the math department fairly recently. But I lucked out that even for this small university with this sort of new computer science department, they had a very eccentric but brilliant man uh, who was a professor there, Dr. Burris. And he, um, he understood what was needed to actually be a real computer scientist. Uh, it wasn't to learn Java, by the way. It's not to learn Perl. It's to understand how computers work. How, to me how does memory work? How do the processors work? The internals. So that when you start running into problems, you can figure out where the problem is happening. He also was a big fan of languages. He actually wrote his own called Burroughs Skull. And that was what we had to use on the tests. So that was really interesting. Um, and he had us do a lot of languages. So even though I was at a university in Texas where the important goal of people graduating from the computer departments was to get a job in the oil industry, um, you needed to know COBOL. So COBOL was a language we had to do multiple years of, believe it or not. But he also had us program real projects in uh, Lisp and Fortran. I did a real code project in Icon and Snowball. I did um, programming in Ada, believe it or not, and BASIC as well, as many other languages that he could think of that we could just do. And the things I learned from that have been foundational for me and my role, because any language that you give me, if I have a reference for it, I can look at that. I can figure out what is the language good for, when do you want to use it, when do you not want to use it, and how do you go about it? Because I have the fundamental understanding of how to do searches, how to do um, uh, item, uh, you know, objects, and so forth. And so over the years, I programmed a lot more languages in my different jobs. And um, I've never met one that I couldn't figure out how to make work. So that was one of the things that I got. Now, you may be wondering why this is up there. One of the um, ways I put myself through school was I did some computer programming. And the first year, the first couple of years I did it, I worked for a quirky gentleman named Dr. Valentine. And Dr. Valentine hired students from the university to come work out of his house. He had, believe it or not, in that time, which was in the 80s, he had a whole bunch of AT&T System 5 computers networked in his basement. And we would all go down there and program. And it was very bizarre. And he was, like I said, pretty quirky, pretty eccentric. Um, one of the things that I programmed was an entire accounting system in Prolog. And um, let me just tell you, don't go there. If somebody suggests it, just say no. Uh, but it was fun. And somehow we got the customer to pay for it. I have no idea how. Um, but the thing that I noticed was I sat down at those computers, and I had programmed Vaxes, and I had programmed on Macintoshes and Windows boxes. But I sat down to that system, and somebody showed me the Unix commands, and I went, oh my gosh, I'm in love. This is my first real love. Um, I loved Unix. It made sense to my brain, and I just felt at home. So um, I had the opportunity to take advantage of the National Lab's really strong student program. If you get a chance, it's very strong, undergraduate and graduate. And I spent two summers of my undergraduate years working at Los Alamos National Labs at the Center for Nonlinear Studies. And part of the things that really helped me there was that experiences with Unix and the experience with the different languages. When I first started working at the Center for Nonlinear Studies, they had actually sat me down and said, here's a computer. It's in Evans and Sutherland. Figure out why it's not working. And um, I don't know if you're experienced, if you know anything about the Evans and Sutherland. It had this weird black box programming language where you connected inputs and outputs, and you didn't really write code. It was very strange. But um, I was unfazed, and I was able to sit down and work at it. I think that kind of gave me a in. 
in some ways. But then they also had a whole bunch of Unix boxes. So that also gave me another end. And so that was sort of my tie-in to the Center for Nonlinear Studies. Now, up to this point, none of this is bleeding edge. These are all sort of standard computers, you, sort of off the shelf. Um, you buy them, you install them, they just work. They've got operating systems that are the standard ones. And there's nothing sort of unusual about it. <clears throat> CNLS um, was a place I ran into my first bleeding edge component. It was a software stack. And that's because the gentleman who was administrating the computers when I was there, and after I graduated, I got a graduate position at the laboratory. He was a Unix guru, one of the old fashioned sort of Unix guys, you know, like with the beard and stuff that you see in the pictures. Um, and he loved research. He really wanted to be doing research. He didn't want to run production computers. Um, so, and he had a whole bunch of buddies at Sun Microsystems. And he would get these early, early, early versions of the operating system. And um, the Center for Nonlinear Studies was outside the fence. It was kind of this um, open place. Los Alamos, for those of you who don't know, is a weapons lab. It mostly does classified work. But we were located outside the fence, and we were there to provide a place where visitors and students could come in for a short period of time, work. There was a big room with lots of sun um, workstations sitting around. People could sit down and work at them. Um, and he would take this as an opportunity to install these really early operating systems on random computers. And you would come in, and you had no idea what OS was going to be on the computer when you came in and sat down. So that was a real interesting experience. And it's actually what led me over to the dark side of system administration. Because I just needed a machine that worked. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience, being on one of the com big computers, you're just going, I just want it to work. I don't care if it's fast. I just want it to work. And so I would come in, and I, would just, I couldn't get any work done, because I would have some weird random OS on my system, and it would fail all the time. So um, he got tired of me you know, beating him up for this. He finally just gave me the root password. And this was well before cybersecurity was a big deal. Um, I don't remember the password, but it's probably something like root. Um, and he, he just said, here's the root password. Do whatever you want. So I started installing the OS. I started fixing things. And I had a very stable system. And then other people around me were going, well, hey, would you mind fixing the one I'm working on? So I started installing the OS on other computers. And eventually, he decided to go off and get a research job at a, at a company. And um, they hired me in as a sysadmin for the systems. Like I said, it was sort of the slope down into the dark side. Um, and it was great. I really enjoyed it. There was nothing super bleeding edge once I got all of them running the same stable OS. Um, but it taught me that users really have the right to expect a workable computer system, that experiments are great, but they don't belong on production systems. That was one of the things I learned. The other thing I learned was some stuff about data centers, which I did not know, because this is my first experience with actually having computers inside a special room that's air conditioned and has special things, such as an emergency power off button. Now, this power off button, um, I got the image off the internet, random one, but it's basically looks very much like the one that we had installed. It's right by the door, and it's there for a reason. It's so that when there's a fire breaks out or a sprinkler system goes off, you can hit that button and you can shut everything down in the data center. It'll immediately, instantaneously go down. That's because you know water and electricity and computers, they don't mix very well. So um, at this time that I was running the systems, things were going pretty smoothly. I was pretty happy. I hadn't paid any attention to where that was located. It was located in this little room right off the data center on the wall. And we had a group of people going around to all the national labs doing safety inspections. They were checking to make sure we were working in a safe environment. Um, and they came into the Center for Nonlinear Studies. I'm a junior person. I'm all awed by these big wigs coming in to investigate us. And I'm don't, I feel afraid of saying anything to them. And one of the auditors, he uh, 
flips over the garbage can, hops up on it, and reaches up to push the emergency light button. There's a head of emergency lights in case the power goes off. And he wanted to test and see if they worked. You guessed it. It was a precarious position. He fell over, and he landed on that button. And that button then shut down all of the power to all of the equipment in the data center. And that was my sort of first experience with things that can go wrong in your data center. And that was a really bad thing to go wrong, let me tell you, um, especially with a ton of spinning disk in there. And I learned this lesson. That's bad. That's good. You do not want that, which is what we had. Soon after that experience, we had that. We put a plastic cover over it. Now, um, as I was going through this, I had a lot of other experiences, what I, which I won't go into in the Center for Nonlinear Studies, because I'm still not really at the bleeding edge. In my last years at Los Alamos, I was there about 13 years, I um, moved to the uh, advanced computing laboratory. And that's where they had the fun machines, the big machines, the thinking machines, and so forth. These are really the ones sort of on the bleeding edge. This is one of the things that I installed. I was a sysadmin. I purchased it. I deployed it. I ran it. It was called the Little Blue Penguin Cluster. And it was um, one of the first fully integrated Linux clusters that was available. And it was really cool. We worked with a company called Alta to install this. and had Linux on it. It was you know, not big in today's world, but in the time, it was a pretty large Linux cluster. But more interesting than that was the packaging they had done. They did this brilliant packaging, big metal blocks, and you could plug them in together, which we did. And uh, they were all this sheet metal that they had done. And um, they were connected with this very interesting Miracom interconnect. It was in a ring configuration, which I learned my lesson there, no ring configurations in your network. Um, because if one failed in the middle of the ring, then everything downstream from it, toast cannot work. Um, and so it was an interesting thing to work on. But it was my first experience with the literal bleeding edge. Because when they made this, this is the first one that they shipped and put on site elsewhere. Those metal panels on the front, you had to slide them up and off. And then you would go in and pull things out. And they were not very careful about how they did the edges. And so there was a ton of sharp metal edges in this thing. And you could not do hardware work on it without cutting yourself. So I actually literally bled all over that. I would have cuts on my hands and my arms. It was just a nightmare. Now, nowadays, we would never put up with this because we're all safety conscious. But at that time, I just, I just kept doing it, kept bleeding on it. So that was one of my bleeding edges there. But then I worked on this system as well. This is the Los Alamos Nirvana and ASCII Blue Mountain systems. They were SGIs. Now, SGIs uh, did workstations, but these were some of their big origins. And they hooked them all together. We had two systems. We had one in the um, uncleared and one in the cleared, so classified and then unclassified. And the unclassified one was small, relatively speaking, but it was a kick-ass machine. It was amazing graphics system. It had 16 graphics pipes, and it was really an amazing system. Very high performance. And then we had the large system, which really didn't have as many graphics pipes, but it had a lot of compute nodes. So it was a very big, powerful system. Um, but we had some issues. This was my first experience with a vendor having to build a system in parts at their site, because they don't have enough space, power, and cooling to build one of these large systems. So they build small chunks. And then they take them to the, bring them to your site. They install them, and they connect up the small chunks as they're delivering and installing them. And then um, this is, so that means not only is this sort of the first of their kind on the floor, it's the first time it's ever been be built fully out. So it's the first time it's ever been run at scale is at your facility instead of being at the vendors. And what this means is you run into really odd things. And one of the odd things you run, we ran into with this was when the people who had written their operating system had written it, they had never envisioned this many nodes hooked together. So they had hard-coded array sizes, buffer sizes, all kinds of things throughout the OS that couldn't handle this many nodes. And so we had all kinds of weird problems. You would boot some, they boot fine, you boot more, and all of a sudden everything started going to falling apart. 
Um, and you would try and run things, and weird things would happen on the network. Weird things would happen on the nodes. It was a real mess. So SGI ended up having to go through their entire operating system stack and scrub it, looking for hard-coded values that weren't big enough to support this system. That was one of the things that happened. And then another thing that happened with this system is things that strike dread in the heart of any system admin or administrator time, trying to actually deploy one of these systems. And unfortunately, it's, it's pretty common with them. When you get these first-of-the-kind systems, you have scary problems. And the top one there is the scariest, which is intermittent wrong answers. And we were getting them on this system. You'd run your code, same binary, same nodes, perfectly fine. Run it five times, perfectly fine. All of a sudden, you run it, and you get the wrong answer out. And you'd be going, what's that about? And you couldn't track it down to a single node. You couldn't track it down to anything. Sometimes it would take you a long time to run and actually hit it. Sometimes you'd hit it really quickly. And it's very hard to figure out where these problems are, because it could be anywhere. It could be in the operating system. It could be in your code, because a lot of these codes are very complicated, um, many thousands lines of code. And these are Fortran codes typically at this time, and they would have go-tos that went to nowhere. And they would just be this spaghetti code. And it would be really hard to track down. And we would um, say, this is the first time I had heard the phrase, this is an incredibly fast machine. As long as you don't care if you get the right answer out, you're good. Um, it took a long time to debug the problem. It turned out that there was a hardware layer, and the designer of the hardware layer said, you know, I don't need to track hardware errors, and I don't need to correct them, and I don't need to you know, notify anybody about them, because the software layer will take care of that for me. The problem is the software layer was expecting the hardware layer to do some manner of error correction, and it was not doing that. And so these errors were slipping through, and they were um, not noticed because they weren't, there was nothing watching and saying, hey, there's an error. Um, and so errors were happening. You were getting your code running fine, no errors coming out, get all the way to the end, and you have the wrong answer. They were eventually able to fix that. That one was not too hard. The next problem was, um, something that also strikes fear into the heart of system administrators, and that's corrupted data on your file systems. Um, again, uh, that's because file systems, while they look really easy on paper, in practice, very complicated. So many things involved. You've got the network, you've got memory, you've got um, the storage itself. There's all kinds of places where things can go wrong. And we had a cluster of file system, CFS. It was SGI's first installation of CFS, and it was a really large one. And it was connected up with HIPI. I don't know if you've heard of HIPI. It was an interconnect system that was, uh, Los Alamos was involved in designing. And it had some, turned out it had some fundamental problems. Um, and we couldn't tell where the issue was. Uh, we just knew that if you read data off the file system and you wrote that data back and you compared them, they would most often not be the same, which is never a good thing. It also meant that if you wrote stuff from memory to disk, it wasn't always guaranteed that what you saw in memory was what would be on the disk. So that was a big problem because this system needed the CFS to actually function. We had problems where when it, somebody would do a checkpoint on the big system, it would actually crash everything because it couldn't write to disk fast enough and it would just take the whole machine down. And when that's behind the fence, that's a big problem, um, especially since it always seemed to happen at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, so these are two things that we ran into with that system. I luckily have not ran into the bottom one that often, and I'm very happy about that. Eventually, we got them worked through, but it took years for the CFS problems. The intermittent wrong answers got addressed probably within the six month time frame. Um, and so at times though, this is sort of my first experience with a large machine, I felt like this boat <laughs> floating out in a wild sea with icebergs around me and no idea if I was ever gonna make it home. Um, and I, I tell you that I had fun, but it was challenging and it was very stressful. Now I'm gonna to jump to Argon. When I moved to Argon, I, um, I worked on a number of systems, but this is the first system that was really outstanding in my mind. It was 
not serial number one because a large version of the blue gene system ended up at, Los Al at Livermore National Lab. It was much larger. We just had one rack, and it came shortly after they had pretty much gotten the one in Los Livermore installed. So it wasn't like I was exploring the bleeding edge, but I had some interesting issues here I thought I'd share with you. Um, one of them is uh, that the blue gene has a very innovative blue gene L and P had a very innovative cooling mechanism. It was air-cooled, but it has 1,024 nodes in it, so it's really dense. These are low-power nodes. There's many of them. That's kind of the idea of it. But it's still a lot of power to dissipate the heat for. And so they had come up with this innovative way to cool it. And you'll notice um, it's kind of weirdly angled like this, if you look at it. That's because on the left and the right side, you have these plenums. And on the right side, it's wide at the bottom, narrows up to the top. And on the left side, it's narrow at the bottom, and it widens up at the top. And the idea is you have lots of air blowing up underneath the raised floor, and that air pressure pushes up. And then on the left side of the rack, there's a whole bunch of fans that are sucking the air across the nodes to cool them down. And then it exhausts the hot air up into the return above. It's really very elegant, and it worked very well. Except for in this room, this is um, a room at Argonne that was an old data center. It had a lot of equipment in it. It had an eight inch raised floor. Now, that's really short in today's. Today ours is a four foot raised floor. It was eight inches and it had had a lot of machines in that data center that had been put in, taken out, put in, lots more put in, taken out. And when people went to remove the machines, they didn't actually remove the cables under the floor. They would just kind of cut them off and let them drop. And um, that meant that there wasn't actually a lot of room for air flow under the floor. So I, I installed this system, and it's not cooling like it's supposed to. And we discovered there's just no air pressure where it's located. There's just nothing that's getting all the way across the data center. And so um, a friend at work, Jean Rackhall, came up with this idea. We had a, seal, a roof fan. You know, uh, you plug it in, it blows, and it creates airflow. And we got some ducting. And if you looked at the picture, you kind of see there's this white, crinkly stuff. That's the ducting. We drilled out a hole in the tile, and we ducted the duct down. And then we built this metal box underneath the computer that the airflow from the fan was ducted into the metal box, which then small area forced the pressure up. And we managed to make it cool enough. But that's the kind of thing that you run into when you get these systems that aren't like other systems. And in fact, this is our next system that we got, because the other machine was like a sysadmin's dream. That thing was so reliable. Nodes hardly ever failed. They're super easy. They're like memory dams that you pop into and out of no boards. Very easy to replace. They had no spinning disk. They had no mechanical equipment on them. They were rock solid. So we, it was a great machine, got a lot of science done on it. So we bought a large version of the next generation, P. Now this was serial number one. We got the first one. And Livermore told me they were really happy we did because we worked out a bunch of problems before they bought theirs. It's a 40 rack system. It's five rows of eight. You can see we're in the middle of installing it. First three rows are basically done, but they don't have their doors on. And the last two are not yet installed fully. And you can see it's still tilted. Um, and it has the plenums. In between every rack is this back um, thing. And behind it is two plenums, one for each rack on the side. Now, that's one of the sysadmins. Our sysadmins don't dress like that. No, no, no. Um, but he, you know, photo op, decided to dress up for this. Um, this was a really cool system. It was cooled exactly the same way. It was 10, 1024 nodes in a rack, super dense. These are the densest racks that have ever been out there, as far as I know. And um, it had more powerful processors. And uh, actually, the cost per rack was exactly the same. Um, and we had some issues with this system, though. When we first got it installed, we got the dreaded intermittent wrong answers. And uh, we spent a lot of time searching and trying to debug this problem. And this one was one where it, you'd had to run pretty big jobs to see them. And they had to run often a long time to see them. So those are particularly hard to debug. But um, we had a great team at IBM working on this. 
And we, found, we finally found an application that pretty consistently caused the problem to occur. And working with that app team, IBM was able to narrow it down to a very small little piece of code that could be run on an individual node and cause the failure. And um, this taught me about something that is now um, something that happens a lot. And I hear it all the time. And it's called yield problems. This, this machine had a yield problem. And um, what that means is that when they're manufacturing the processors, they, they stamp out a certain number of them. I'll just you know, kind of gloss over all the nitty gritty details. And they then test them. And they check to see, are they, can they run at the frequencies and the voltages that they expect to do in order to get the performance they expect. And some number of them won't. And they have to sort of toss those away, or they give them to somebody who doesn't need as high performance of a system. And that's the yield that they get out of it. Now, one of the reasons why this machine had an order of magnitude higher performance per rack over the L, and not more expensive, and basically not a much more power, was because of Moore's law and Denard scaling and so forth. You know, that at that point in time, they could still make things smaller. So the feature size of like the logic gates and the transistors on the chips, they could make them smaller, pack a lot more in, get a lot more performance without a lot more energy. That was a great time to be alive in the computer world. Um, and they were packing them in so tightly, though, that all of a sudden the, the um, manufacturing defects begin to play a lot bigger part. And you would experience voltage leakage, and that would impact them and how they would work. And if you had a, just the minutest manufacturing defect, it could actually cause real problems on the machine. And that's what was happening here. They had manufacturing defects that weren't being caught when they were going through screens. And I think this took us somewhere between six months to nine months. I don't remember the exact length of time. It seemed like it was forever. Um, where they screened, replaced a bunch of nodes, still had the problem. Screened, replaced a bunch of nodes, still had the problem. They finally figured it out, finally got a screen built with this um, QCD code, which is one of the codes that we love because it can be used to beat up the system and find problems like this. And they finally got it figured out, and we finally got the nodes all replaced again, and it was pretty stable. But we had one other problem with this system, which was quite unusual in some ways. Um, it was with the bulk power modules. And those are the things that are across the top of the rack. Uh, they're new with every single generation. They redesign them. They're special with everyone. These had a bunch across the top, and they were in an M plus one configuration. We were having a lot of failures, and we didn't know why. So yeah, they, one would fail, and they'd be redundant, so it was OK. They're made so you can pop them out hot, stick them in hot. No problem. Well, the problem that we ran into, though, was somebody was walking through the data center, and they heard this little pop. I'm like, what's that? And you know, maybe a little later, somebody else hears another pop, and they're kind of going, huh, what's that? Well, it turned out what it was was a capacitor inside the bulk power modules that was basically shorting out and kind of exploding. Um, these are 480 volt, and you really don't want exploding things in your 480 volt electrical system. So um, while we were working out what the issue was, which turned out to be a cheap capacitor that they had put in, couldn't stand up to the loads we were putting on it, it was a little too close to some other components on the board in the bulk power module, um, it was causing them to pop. And when they did, on occasion, they would arc flash. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but an arc flash is bad. It would actually burn holes in the racks. So we would have to replace the whole rack because you had a big hole in your rack. Um, we were just lucky that none of these went off and caused the sprinkler system to go off, because that would have been you know, bye-bye to the whole machine. Um, as I said, computers and water don't mix. Um, and so in the end, uh, IBM had to completely redesign all the power modules and completely do a replacement. For a long time, though, while they were doing that, we had stacks and stacks and stacks of these, because the um, workaround was just to let them fail and then change them out. And it was where we really started paying attention to safety. So these are a, this is a sysadmin, and he's getting ready to do something with 480 volt. We got our sysadmins. They now had to be trained in high voltage electrical safety. Um, they had these outfits that were pretty wild. They're wearing uh, um, 
flame retardant equipment, non-flammable clothing. They have special face shields in case something arc flashes in front of them, special hats. They have gloves that are uh, cotton inside and then rubber over top, and you had to replace them every six months. And we had this process where uh, when they went to change one of these bulk power modules, they had to have at least three people. One would stand by the panel to flip breakers in case something happened. One would be far away as an observer who would be watching the guy in the panel and watching the guy doing the work, and then one guy doing the work. And we had to call the fire department before we did it. So we call up the fire department and say, hey, we're going to change out a bulk power module. They'd say, OK. And we'd do the thing, and then we'd be alive afterwards, and we'd call up the fire department and say, hey, it went OK. Um, so that they would be prepared to rush over. Luckily, they weren't very far away. But that's what we went through while we were changing these all out. Um, and in, in the end, it proved to be very valuable. And we've just kept that sort of safety conscious nature as we're working with these systems. OK, so then um, to a more recent, slightly more recent, this is the Blue Gene Q. This is a system that's currently on the floor. I don't know if you have time on it or not as part of this program. But again, all of the Q, Blue Gene systems were amazing systems, really fast, really reliable. You could scale. They scaled like a dream. They were really lovely systems. But again, this was a um, brand new system. And this time, they still had 1024 nodes in Iraq. But they were a lot more powerful. And they rejected a lot of heat. Um, so they couldn't cool it with the air cooling. So they came up with this very cool, innovative water cooling technique. And, um, over here on the right-hand side, you can see us while we're installing it. We had to bleed the air out of the water system. Those pipes running up, those kind of copper-looking pipes running up, that's the water delivery system. And if you look at this, this is one of the note boards. You can see the two um, hoses coming off. Those are the supply and a return. And then there's a quick connect at the end. And then the copper runs through the rack. It runs past the optical first because that's the most critical to cool down. And then it weaves through the rack um, in a serpentine fashion so that every one of the processors can basically, the node boards latch down onto it. There's thermal material. And the processor basically rests directly on the copper um, that runs through it. Now, the challenges we had here were quite interesting. This is why I love being a sysadmin at these big systems, because everything's new every time. Um, and we had the problem here that the water quality in the process loop, this water that ran through to cool it, well, you've got copper and stainless steel, and PVC, and rubber. And we actually, at one point, had black iron in the loop. And this is not good, because when you mix all of these, chem these metals together, it's really hard to come up with a chemical solution in the water that won't erode the copper or cause problems with the black steel or something like that, so you get particles in it. If you got particles in it, that little end of the quick connect, that's where you disconnect it from the water supply. It has the smallest diameter of everything in the system. And if a particle came along and it got stuck in there, it would keep the little connector depressed. And so when you disconnect, you'd spray water everywhere because it wouldn't wouldn't close. It would be open, just spraying water all over your lovely computer system. It was um, kind of freaky the first time we pulled it out and it sprayed water everywhere. It was going, ah! Um, so that was uh, one of the challenges with it. And I, I used to tell people, OK, so I'm not a water quality engineer, but I play one in my job because nobody really knew how to do this. This is sort of the first one of these water cooled, direct water cooled systems. And nobody really knew what the water quality should be. And I spent time talking to accelerator people who run pure water through their systems. They scrub their systems every six months because it's really important. They have no, nothing in their systems. We didn't want to go that far. So that was one of the things that we dealt with with the system. Another thing, and this is the thing with these large supercomputers, in particular now, we, buy, we place the contract with the vendor three, four years before the computer is delivered. And we want the latest, greatest, state-of-the-art at the time of delivery. We want the, you know, we keep telling ourselves we're not going to do everything state-of-the-art at the time of delivery. But then we still get sucked into state-of-the-art at the time of the delivery. Um, and what happens is uh, when you place the order with the vendor, it's not actually a real thing. There's no hardware yet. There's no racks. They're going to design, finish designing the chip. They're going to design 
the packaging. They're going to do it all, and every single time it's very different. They don't just reuse the same things. So um, <clears throat> with the blue jean system, Q system, the vendor had given us an estimated weight, and we said, great, that works fine in our data center. And maybe nine months before the machine was due to be delivered, the vendor called us up and said, well, you know, we've got some hardware now, and it's going to weigh a little bit more. And so we went out and we looked. And um, this is a four-foot feet raised floor. And if one of these racks goes into that floor, somebody could be seriously injured. So we wanted to make sure we weren't just guessing. We hired a company. They came in. They did this cool destruction testing. They took a bunch of the posts that were left over from the floor, and they put it through all these things to destroy them and figure out exactly when it failed. It was really very cool. Um, <clears throat> and they came back and they said, you're borderline. You'll probably be OK, eh, but maybe you won't. Eh. So we recommend that you replace that floor. So we um, had a, a company. We hired them in. They came in, and they. Um, completely replaced all the posts in the back part of the room, the south part of the data center. Luckily, that was completely empty. So they took the whole floor out. They put new posts in. You can kind of see them working here. This is a very cool drill they had. We drill the holes, and it had a nice tight suction. It would suck all the concrete dust up and out so you didn't get it into your data center, get blown into all those fans. Um, and then we put this nice wood tile, <laughs> wood-looking tile, I should say, and ran around the room to tell people, everything over here, you can roll the racks. Everything over here, you cannot roll the racks. And we put signs up saying what load was possible. <clears throat> and it was all going very well. Everything's smooth. We got all the equipment. I mean, all the stuff installed. We're ready for the system. And you know, maybe three to four months later, IBM calls us up again and says, ah, well, you know, we got some hardware, and we actually put together a rack put everything in it, put all the water into it, we weighed it. And it's a little bit more. Um, it's 800 pounds more per rack, which is you know, not a little bit more. So this meant that the racks weighed over two tons each. We were like, hmm, <laughs> OK, back to the drawing board. And we went back to the same company and we had them come out and do an assessment. They basically said, you know, you're fine on the subfloor. The replacements that you did, you're all good. However, your tiles are not sturdy enough. If you run over them multiple times, they're going to start to crack, and eventually something's going to collapse, and it's not going to be good. So we um, went out and purchased a whole bunch of the heaviest duty tiles that were available. We got them colored gray because we weren't going to replace every tile in the data center, and we wanted them to know very clearly where they could and couldn't roll the racks. And so that's why we have those odd tiles um, under the system and in front of it. Uh, it turned out to be um, a good thing, and it's just one of those things that happens with these computers, these sort of bleeding edge computers. You never know. We also had a problem with this computer, intermittent wrong answers. Surprise. Um, and that turned out to be a problem with the QA. Uh, the company, one of the manufacturing companies would test the nodes, the processors, and it would put it inside this little thing and it would hold it. And they didn't calibrate it right, and it held it too tight. And it caused little cracks, micro cracks, in the silicone, in the solder around the chip. And um, it just so happened that was where the memory interfaces were. And you wouldn't know because until you heated and cooled, and heated and cooled, and heated and cooled, and those cracks would expand. And all of a sudden, you get these really weird errors. It took them a long time to figure that one out as well. And I think our friends with QCD helped us out there too. Um, so that was, uh, that was another interesting one. And we also had power module problems. When QCD would run a certain configuration, if you were in the data center, you'd hear them singing. They would hum. That's also not a good thing. If your power modules are humming, worry. And uh, so we looked into it. Um, our next big computer, just to finish up because I'm running way over time, is going to be Aurora. It's coming in the 2021 20, time frame, and it's going to be a bleeding edge system. We will get the first ones, and um, it is going to be an exascale system. So it'll be over 1,000 petaflops. So this is going to be a pretty large system, and a pretty powerful system, and a pretty important system. It is going to fully support, as first class citizens, the data, the learning, and simulation. That's very cool. It has a lot of software stuff that's being done. So we're going to have you know, bleeding edge software, and we're going to have bleeding edge hardware. It's going to be a new packaging. We'll have bleeding edge packaging. 
So once again, we're kind of going, yeah, we were hoping to get not the first of everything again, but yet we are. Um, and it's uh, got a brand new architecture. It's pretty exciting. I can't tell you anything about it because it's secret at the moment. Hopefully it'll be less secret sometime soon. But if you want to read a little bit about like guidelines for how you program to it, there's some information on the call that we did for our early science projects. Um, but that's our next big bleeding edge computer. And um, I thought I'd end with a few comments. I know people have asked me before, you know, why do you do this? Why do you have these big, super, super large supercomputers that first is a kind, putting them on the floor, and they're just a very challenging to get working, nine months to a year, oftentimes to get them really running in a real production mode. And I found this when I was looking for the photos of the Burroughs computer. And it's kind of hard to see. It was a Sperry advertisement. It says, you know, this costs a whole lot less when it happens inside our computer. And this is really a large part of why we do what we do. It's because it's very hard to do things like uh, experiments in the supernova space in the real world. It's kind of hard to go out and say, I'm going to have a supernova and I'm going to test this thing. Well, that didn't quite work out. Let me do another supernova and I'll test that thing. Um, it's also hard to do things like modeling hurricanes because you can't actually go out and make a hurricane happen and say, ah, now I'd like to kind of see what happens if I have the same hurricane come in exactly the same way, but I model it using these parameters. So um, a computer system of these scale can attack problems that you can't do with small computers. You need them at this scale to do these major grand challenge problems that a lot of people say. And I've had people also ask me, well, OK, yeah, that's great, but why do you do this? And I'm actually very passionate and excited about installing these new systems. They are difficult. They are challenging. But I kind of think of this as being an explorer. I am never going to hike up Mount Everest. You probably are surprised by that, but I am not actually going to do that. I'm also not going to be the first woman at the North Pole or the South Pole or anything like that. But this is an opportunity for me to do something that nobody's ever done before. It's an opportunity to work on systems that have never been built before with new architectures and new networks and new cooling and new data center um, functionality. And it can be challenging, but it can be fun. And I hope as you're working through this and you're getting into your own challenges and trying to make parallel computing work for you, which can be a challenge, that you too find it exciting and fun. Um, and I'll just end with a little picture of everybody jumping off into that ice cold water with a smile on their faces. So thank you very much.